So hello everyone. So while we're waiting right now, so this is a, a webinar uh, uh, out of a series that we have to in preparation for the in conclusion of the challenge, second challenge for the generative AI use for for uh, uh, chip design, and we uh, we have a few things to touch on uh, around the webinar, but um, there is also another one tomorrow. Uh, uh, that we agreed that we uh, committed to actually make available for the community for about around the back end development and Caravel overview, which is a chip uh, carrier that is being used for uh, 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 the competition. And so we found uh, we received uh, input that uh, the community wants to know more about it in, in order to refresher. So we're going to provide that. And, and then today, uh, it's going to join us, uh, Professor uh, Hammond Pierce uh, uh, from the University of uh, New South Wales, Sydney School of Computer Science and Engineering. And um, he he has been um, uh, working, you know, he's been working in, in uh, or uh, visiting scientists at the new uh, NYU Department of Electrical Engineering and NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, his research is a uh, mainly on cybersecurity and also machine learning and the implications of machine learning on design and, and the security of design uh, in, in, in hardware. So Dr. Pierce joined us and, uh, um, and you're ready to go if you, if you have all the setup uh, is correctly done. So go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, let me just share my screen now. Hey, here we go. Let's get rid of these tabs. Okay, and we are sharing. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Outstanding. Okay, great. Okay, um, so what I'm going to be talking about today, thank you for that introduction, um, is about using the generative AI, particularly things like ChatGPT, um, for hardware development. Uh, and um, in particular, I'm going to be framing this discussion around the uh, uh, success that we had um, in making uh, a processor design with it, but also um, the various other things that we've um, discovered as well in our process. So um, thank you for the introduction, just as a, there's my brief summary again. So currently I'm a lecturer at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Previously, I was at New York University um, for the Center for Cybersecurity. And before that, I did my PhD at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so the reason that I'm really interested in all of this work um, is because I feel that AI and the various types of AI that we've got at the moment is very much on the cusp of transforming the uh, you know traditional way that we interact with um, and work with computers of various kinds. Right, so I'm really interested in exploring how this works within the EDA space and within the hardware design space and trying to answer the question, what do we need before we can have AI to help us design hardware? So in the greater EDA space, of course, machine learning being applied to the problem is not new, right? There's been for a very long time increasing pressures on design requirements, um, and there's been increasingly large usage of machine learning throughout the design flow for things like verification and layout uh, and so on and so forth. What is new is this idea that we might be able to bring in this, this new type of AI called a large language model and to be able to use that to bridge the gap between the specifications for your design, which might be in plain language, it might be in English, um, and the actual design itself. And we actually started work looking at this problem all the way back in 2020 with a paper that used GPT-2 um, and looked at whether or not we could train a language model to actually understand basic elements of specifications documents and translate that automatically into Verilog. Um, but of course, since 2020, a lot has happened since GPT-2, right? Since the, really it's been the last two years um, in a big way where we've seen these large, large language models like GitHub Copilot, like ChatGPT, um, and, and, and like OpenAI's Codex that have come forward and really demonstrated, you know, startlingly good capabilities at producing uh, code in particular. So all of the models that you see on the screen here and all of these different news articles, these are all what I would call autocomplete models, right? So they look at what you're writing, 
Uh, they look at the, the kinds of text that you're producing, and then they try and produce more of it. So if you give it a small amount of a snippet, if you use something like GitHub Copilot, right, you start writing some code, uh, and then you, you know, you hit, so you see suggestions coming up, and then you can hit next, and, and then you can get um, additional code suggestions. And I really wanted to uh, show this in a demo, but I'm having some technical problems on my side, and I've had to change computers, so I have nothing installed, unfortunately. Um, and so I don't know if I'll be able to do that. I'm trying to multitask at the moment to, to install these things, but um, we might have to come back while they're installing in the background. So the next thing that, of course, that we've seen is um, AIs that can work in a more conversational space. Whoopsies, I've lost my slides. That was on me. Uh, and these uh, conversational large language models, they uh, work by following instructions. So here you might have something, you know, the, the famous one here, of course, is ChatGPT. So ChatGPT, unlike Copilot and the other autocomplete style models, it works by following instructions, which you can give it in a sort of conversational way. So you can say, you know, hey, ChatGPT, can you finish implementing this design for me? Or even better, hey, ChatGPT, I need to make something. Can you make it for me? Um, and it's actually quite competent in a number of areas, in particular in software. So we've seen, you know, tremendous uh capabilities in, in languages like python and javascript which have tons and tons of resources online that these models were able to be trained over for languages like verilog though and vhdl and the other hardware languages they've not been quite so competent right they've not been quite so capable and so the the, the challenge here is is that the language models maybe won't work quite as well just because there wasn't that much training data there to begin with. And if you work in the hardware space, you'll know that this is, you know, happening as well because the, you know, that the, when you Google a problem in, in Verilog, it's often much harder to find an answer than if you're Googling some kind of equivalent problem in, uh, in say, uh, in, in, say, Python. So let's just have a quick primer on how large language models work. This is only five minutes, uh, not even five minutes long. So we'll just have a quick dive in here. So, so I've been talking about large language models like ChatGPT. How do they actually work under the hood? Well, they're fundamentally just a large neural network, which is trained over a huge amount of text to simply predict the next token. It's like a game. Here is a, a bunch of tokens. I want you to predict the next one. And what is a token? A token is like a small part of a word. Usually they're about four characters long. It turns out that when you make these networks really, really big and you train them over a huge amount of text, uh, i.e. like the entire internet, that they actually get quite good at doing this game. Uh, and so OpenAI in particular over the last few years has been training successively larger and larger models and impressing us more and more with their capabilities, going from models that could, you know, like GPT-2 kind of produce coherent text to GPT-3, which could not only produce coherent text, but on a variety of subjects and mostly accurately. So for instance, you could say, you know, hey, GPT-3, can you recite the first law of robotics? And it would be able to do that for you. But then also you take these models and you do additional training called fine tuning over some corpus, say over GitHub, and then you eventually end up with something like GitHub Copilot, which is capable of not just producing prose, but also producing code. So this is how it looks a little bit under the hood. So for instance, this is going to be using C, but you know, substitute your, your favorite language of your choice in this diagram. So if we put an int in C, we might get out main as the next word, right? Seems plausible. Now, the cool thing about language models is they're autoregressive. So I can now put an int main as the input and then get a parentheses out. And then I can put an int main as the parentheses and get maybe a closing parentheses or maybe int arg c or something like that, right? And this goes on and on and on until eventually you've assembled your whole program and actually the large language model has done most of the work. How you actually choose the next token, you can choose that. That's, a, that's actually a parameter that you can change within these language models. You can do things like in, increasing temperature, which changes the creativity of this token, uh, and you can change various other parameters as well. But fundamentally, this is what's happening under the hood. So our goal here is to produce ASICs, right? We're, we're on this call because we want to talk about hardware. So how do we go from this kind of idea of here, yeah, we have some prompts and we have some code, but we want to give it to the language model and we want to get out hardware. Well, obviously, this is a big process, right? I showed that diagram at the start with all of the different steps. In this talk, we're going to focus just on this first part, right? This loop between the prompt, the language model, getting some design, and then trying to verify that design. After, of course, you have the design, you need to synthesize it. That's what actually turns your design into an ASIC. But fortunately, OpenLane, um, which is, you know, 
handled very, very well by eFabless, they make this really, really easy, right? So we just go from a design, we put it into the eFabless flow, uh, and then you can turn that into an ASIC at the end of the day through this, this flow that they provide, going from your design files to the GDS2 file, and then they'll send that off and, and actually fabricate it, which is really, really cool. So let's have a quick demo now. Now, I, as I said, I was having a little bit of trouble with my um, technical problems, um, but that's okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly share ChatGPT now, and um, I'm going to just give you an example of how we can actually build stuff here um, using ChatGPT. So I'm going to do a new share now, and I'm going to target myself at my other screen. Let's try it. Uh, so new share, and we're switching to screen two. Okay, so hopefully now you can all see my chat GPT window. And if you can't, please tell me so in the in the webinar chat. Um, and I'll zoom in a little bit now so that the font's a little bigger. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to try and make some modules, right? Because this is what we're here at the end of the day. So I'm going to start by just saying, you know, let's make a basic Verilog module, uh, and we'll start with making something like, I don't know, a linear feedback shift register. Uh, so can you implement a linear feedback shift register? And we'll give it some parameters, right? Make it eight bits long uh, with taps in the first, fourth, and fifth position. Right, I've just made this up. Okay, now you'll notice I'm using GPT-4. This is the paid version of the model. Uh, it's a little bit better at writing Verilog, which is why I'm gonna use it today. And I'll, I'll show some results that we got with GPT-3.5 earlier as well. Um, and let's just quickly see um, what the uh, language model comes up with here. Um, so we've got, uh, what has it done? Okay, so we've got a linear feedback shift register. The shift register was here. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so what have we got? Uh, it seems so. We have a reset signal. It sends the initial value to be one. We've got some taps. Um, okay, it's it's doing the other. This is my first position is the seventh position, which is okay. So you can see here there's already maybe, um, you know, what does first mean? That's a great question, right? Does first mean most significant bit or least significant bit, right? So it's it's assumed that first means most significant bit. Is that correct? I have no idea. Um, that's really going to be up to your specification. Um, last time I did this, which was about an hour ago, if it'll let me load my old conversation, which it doesn't want to do. Okay, cool. Uh, here's another one that I did. Okay, I don't want to use that. I want to use this one. Okay, here's my other one, uh, which I loaded earlier, and this time it also used. Okay, so first, clearly it seems to have a, a bias for first being most significant, but here's another one that I did. Um, this time first meant least significant, but so you can definitely see that, okay, it's not always um, the, uh, the, it's not always the consistent output, right? And so that's one of the things I want to stress here is that, your quality of your specification is really going to impact the quality of the code that you get out. And this is a very short specification. Okay, so um, that's some discussion. So right, let's me switch back to my slide. And I'm confident now that we're swapping between presentations. Good, so now we're back to the slide. Um, so you can see here, did we spot any errors? Um, not necessarily, but we definitely spotted that, you know, what does first mean in the first position? Is that the most significant bit or the least significant bit? Okay, so now what we want to do is, okay, we've got some module, we want it to test the module, right? Seems reasonable, I've got some code, I need to know, make sure that that code works. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and make a test pitch, which actually instantiates this model, and then we're going to try and make a make file, which would call that using iVerilog. Okay, so now we're going to switch back to the other screen. Cool. Uh, so let's go, can you make a test bench, which instantiates this module? Reasonable. Let's see what GPT-4 comes up with. Okay, so it says it's going to apply a clock cycle with a 50% duty cycle, assert some reset signal internally, and then release it to observe some output, which sounds plausible to me. Okay, all right, so what have we got? There's some clock generation block here. We've got some test sequence. It puts in a reset. It says observe, good. Uh, and then it says we'll monitor the output here. Um, so this is interesting. So what is this test bench doing? Actually, all this test bench does is instantiate it, which is reasonable, right? Because I just said instantiate. Uh, but it's not actually doing any testing, right? This is just running it. 
Um, so maybe we could say, can you make it test a few um, of the cycles of the LFSR, right? And maybe I'm being a bit mean, right? Because I've not actually, um, I've not actually told it what the correct values are. Right. I've, I've not told it what the correct values are. And a real specification would actually tell it what the correct signals are. And so, you know, it's got to now do a whole lot of maths, which language models are terrible at, um, because it needs to go, okay, we started with cycle one here, and then it needs to actually work out what the correct bits should be using this. Um, so let's see if it actually comes up with something that sounds plausible. Okay, it's define a function. Oh, no, it's not going to define a function. It's going to get us to do it. No, no, it is. If out equals expected out. All right. So two, four, nine. I, I am not good enough at math to know if this is correct or not, but um, maybe. I don't think so because... Yeah, I don't think that that's correct, but I haven't got a simulator to run, unfortunately. Oh, it's just talking us through it now. Uh, interesting. Okay, well, it's doing it. It's doing its best, um, and it sounds plausible to me, right? Without actually running it in the simulator, maybe it is even correct, um, which would be very cool. So you can see now that this test bench is getting a little bit better, but realistically, the specification should actually include what the correct values are going to be, right? Because it's, it's a, it has to work pretty hard to work out whether or not those values are, are good or not. Okay, so now what do we need to do? We have a test bench, we have a main file, let's make it to make a make file too. This is actually something it's very good at. Uh, can you make me a make file which calls iVeriLog, uh, which calls with these modules, uh, assume that the file names are the same as the module names, right? Because these are mod Verilog modules and either make files and stuff. They work over files, so. Okay, uh, so now we can see, what does it come up with for this? Okay, it's been a little verbose. It's got some source files. Okay, yeah. Honestly, that looks good to me. Great. So, um, so yeah, so there you go. Look at that. So now it's made us a make file as well. And so if I was on the correct computer, uh, what would happen is I would now copy all of these files together and we would run it and it would probably work, um, which is really, really cool because um, the really neat thing about this is that, you know, the, the, the quality of the code that you get out, at least for these kinds of, you know, I don't want to say trivial examples, but this was relatively straightforward, right? It's just an LFSR, an LFSR test bench, um, and then a make file. Uh, you know, is is really, really nice. And it, I think it really shows the promise of these models as a approach. But what I want to do now is actually highlight a problem that I had in the one that I ran about an hour ago, if it'll let me. But I'll just hit refresh on this again. Um, so this is the, the same, I did exactly the same experiment about an hour ago, right? And it actually gave me different results because that's the way that this works. Um, and the thing that it did here, which was really interesting, is it put the LFSR state to be all ones. Now, the problem is, of course, with a three-bit input like this, that means the input is going to be a one, right? Because if you have a triple XOR like this and the input is all ones, uh, this will just stay at one, right? Every bit that shifts in is going to be a one every single time. Um, and so what happens is when I ran this and, and tested it is this LFSR was actually just jammed um, at, at the fully one state, right? It was jammed at value 255. So... You know, it, it even is making that mistake. Um, it's not, you know, so so I think again, you know, there's a there's a real risk to go, oh wow, this is amazing. You know, it, it, look how amazing the high quality code is here. But actually, then when you dive in a little deeper and you try and execute it, you realize that sometimes uh, that what it's producing is only superficially good. Uh, and so you really, really do need to be able to work out yourself is the answer of this quality where the value is broken or maybe this quality, which is the one we just did, where the value was great. And you'll see that I actually did pretty much line for line the exact same prompt uh, for these two conversations, right? So as a, you know, as a user of the model, I'm giving it the same thing. And why is one of my answers so much better than the other one? Right? So, so that's just, I think, something that I want everyone to reflect on now. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. 
Okay. So, was it syntactically correct? Yes. Uh, I think we're up to the point now where ChatGPT and friends are very, very good at coming up with syntactically correct models. Um, and so now I, I've got this thing here, can you try different models? And, and um, I think that uh, this is, this is, I think, one of the most interesting parts of, of doing the demo. And I'm, I, I probably won't do it today for interest of time, but um, if, if, if you're, you know, if you're do doing this yourself, which I hope you are, do have a try out using these other models like Google's Bard um, in particular, uh, because that's the one that, you know, is really trying to compete with OpenAI right now. Um, but also Hugging Chat. Hugging Chat is a, is a free and open source large language model, um, which purports to write some programming languages. And there's another one now called Star Chat, which you could also try out to Star Chat. Um, and I'm going to skip through these examples now. So, so um, yeah, so we've got some reflections here. Here on the slide here, I've got just, I'm trying to create a Verilog model for a shift register, right? And so you can see here my specifications maybe a little bit more. Um, uh, oh, okay, I can see someone's put in a question. I'll come back to that question in a moment. Um, so we can see here, I'm trying to create a Verilog model for a shift register. And this specification you can see is a little bit more robust, right? We've, we've said a lot more of the details that, you know, I think a human when they were implementing this would almost always end up with exactly the same design. Um, although we haven't said, for instance, whether or not this is a synchronous or an asynchronous reset, but we're getting a lot closer to having an actual fixed design. Um, so what we end up with is, yeah, and I, I see another comment here from Jamie. I'm about to come to that, Jamie. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's very good. It is good at recognizing mistakes. So um, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, and you can see here that actually GPT-4 has actually done some assumptions itself, and it's actually stated the assumptions, which is quite cool. So here's some of the other models when we give it the same problems. Uh, so you can see here, ChatGPT-4 gave us a reasonably nice shift register. ChatGPT-3.5, this is the 3.5 model, the free model. Um, that gave us a pretty good one as well. Um, Google Bard was interesting because it is confused about how wide the data should be. And so it's actually got a, a really big mistake in that it's got an 8-bit data input for a shift register. So this whole module is not going to work. Uh, and then Hugging Chat um, kind of... It's very difficult to describe what Hugging Chat was doing here. It started with Verilog and then it, it kind of lost the plot. Um, so yeah, definitely interesting to see that the difference in the in the different model qualities here. Um, so what we've kind of noted already today is that the human feedback can lead to design success, right? So um, as Jamie has actually just said in the chat, is that ChatGPT is actually pretty good at recognizing mistakes, right? And so I can actually go back to that and show you this now, right? So let's go back to his. So I'm going to go back to the faulty one that I, I mentioned, which said that this is all set to ones. And I'm just actually going to tell it that, right? This is what we observed. I ran this and the output was all ones all the time. Can you troubleshoot and fix this? Okay, so we'll see what it says. I know what the problem is, which is that the reset is all ones. Okay, it's going to tell me. Um, Aha, uh -huh. okay, so it has straight away said the taps. Try initializing it to a non-zero value. Okay, cool, yep, yeah. so this is good, actually. It's got the correct fix here for us, right? So it said maybe you could try eight HFE, um, and that would hopefully fix it, although I actually think that this is just going to shift in another one. Um, yeah, here we go. Sometimes initial state so it says here, consult your textbook, right? Give me a better specification, which is fair. Um, so yeah, so it's this is actually pretty good advice coming out of chat GPT here. And, and honestly, the, 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 the number one fix here is actually the correct one. And what it's said to do here is to go consult the textbook to try and find a good initial state, right? Which is probably the best advice you could give someone when trying to come up with an LFSR, because all of this has been, you know, done to death in, um, in uh, you know, mathematics textbooks and stuff like that. Okay, so let's head over back to the, the new share on our slides again. Okay, I can see there's a couple more questions coming in. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to answer both of these questions in a moment, but I, I can see they're all here, so do keep sending them in, and I'll get to them when I get to them. Okay, uh, so, uh, so what we've observed is that if I give it feedback like I did just then, we can get quite good design success. And so the question that we had at this point was actually how, how complex a design can we go? And what we wanted to do was try and make a full 8-bit processor. 
Okay, and we had some constraints, which is that we were trying to fit this into, uh, into the program called Tiny Tape Out. So Tiny Tape Out says that you can only have a thousand standard cells worth of stuff, which is a bit of a meaningless metric as it turns out. Um, but uh, I said, you know, this is my prompt that I gave it to the language model. I said, look, you know, we're using um, this process. We only have a thousand standard cells. I think we should restrict ourselves to an accumulator based 8-bit architecture. All right, and so this is kind of all I gave it. And then from here, um, we tried to, to build one. So I have a repository, um, which I'm just going to link. Uh, and if you're interested, I encourage you to go and check it out. And the reason for that is because we have recorded every single conversation, the entire conversation history of us building an entire processor. This is using human feedback. So um, I'll now just share back to the other screen again, I'm getting pretty good at swapping between screens. So hopefully you can now see my GitHub repository. Um, which says it's not protected, so that's good. Um, I think that's just a message for me, so that's fine. Uh, so what have we got in here? Uh, it's called TTO3 because it went for Tiny Tape Out 3. Um, Verilog QT Core A1, that's the name of it. Um, and you can see we've got all this description of the processor and stuff here in the README. It's actually detailed enough that you can run this on an FPGA um, and build a, a programmer and stuff for it. But if we head into the chats folder here, um, you'll see we've got all of the conversations that I actually had with ChatGPT on how to build this design. So we can go into the specifications. So you can see here's my prompt here. Let us make a brand new microprocessor. And then you can see this is what ChatGPT said. And then you can see what I said. And then you can see what it, it said. And you know, we started by building an ISA and I actually got ChatGPT to build the ISA and stuff as well. Now, one of the things that you'll see here is I've got this hash restart. When you're doing stuff in ChatGPT, if you don't like love the answer, you can actually just hit this regenerate. And what it will do is it'll actually just try again. Um, as I got better at using ChatGPT, and this is kind of an intuitive thing, um, I stopped using restarts. But uh, so, you know, I don't even know why I hit restart on this one, for instance. Um, I, maybe I just didn't like the list of instructions that came out, right? So. Um, but the, the, that's the nice thing, right? If, if you don't feel like coming up with a new prompt or you feel like your prompt is good enough, you can actually just hit regenerate and it'll come up with another answer. And I recorded the number of times I used that. Um, and you can see, you know, as the conversation goes on, I'm, I get, you know, oh, sometimes I hit restart. This time it was just, can you format the table? And obviously it didn't quite format the table correctly the last time, right? So um, I was trying to give it as little input as possible um, and getting it to slowly build stuff. And we can go through, you know, all the way into say like here where we're actually getting it to write um, code. So this is the, the ISA that it gave us. Uh, and then now you can see here, ChatGPT is starting to produce the code for us. Um, and then, you know, I've got, I think, give missing alt codes and then it tries again. And then it goes, does it take into account and I, right? So I'm actually giving it the feedback that it kind of needs. It's, it's quite directed feedback. Um, but uh, eventually, you know, it comes up with the right code. So let's head back to the head back to the slides. So this is the conversation map. Um, sometimes you need to go back to an earlier conversation, right? So you can see here that we we do the specification, the register specification, some shift registers, some multi-cycle stuff, control units, and eventually, after we've made an assembler. This is where I can start to simulate the design because now I can put programs into it. And it was straight after that that we realized that there was, you know, catastrophically bad problems with the processor and it was just fundamentally broken in many, many different cytological ways. And so from that point, you know, from conversation nine onwards, we could go back to the earlier conversation. So you see here, conversation 10 actually continues conversation zero and we start saying, hey, there was a problem here. Uh, we, need to, we need to fix that problem, right? And so we're continuing the conversation within ChatGPT to get it to start fixing things. Um, so hopefully that, um, that's kind of your thoughts here, Jamie, is that you can actually get ChatGPT to recognize the mistakes and actually fix them. And that's what we observed here. And we even got it down to actually doing optimizations. This wasn't even a bug fix. We just wanted it to use less logic elements. Um, so this is the data path we ended up with at the end. Uh, and so, you know, this was not really architectured by me. I, I drew the picture, uh, but um, GPT-4 actually, you know, suggested the registers. Uh, I, you know, I confirmed its decisions for it, but essentially it was the one steering itself towards it. And you'll also notice this is quite a peculiar architecture, right? Like it is an accumulator based on that it doesn't really map to everything. Probably the closest architecture is like the pick, 
Um, but it's, it is rather peculiar. And that's what I liked about this is that we weren't just trying to make a risk five core or something where it's seen that training data here. We really were going, no, you know, I want you to make something kind of new and, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so reflections on this. Uh, so we called this chip chat. We were talking with the large language models to generate hundred percent of our Verilog. It has some problems, right? So scalable, uh, you know, maybe it's faster than doing it by hand. Maybe it isn't. Um, it has probably some, you know, some concerns on limitations of third party models. We've got to have a human um, and, you know, is the actual final design correct? You know, we, we have to do things. Um, so what we want to do, right, this is our vision, is we want to have something that's fully automated. So, so we built this framework now that actually kind of tries to automate this, right? You'll see it here, it falls back to human feedback. If it can't solve the problem itself, uh, it, 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 we, we, you know, we will prompt for a human to come in and actually step in. But you can kind of see over here that we can have this kind of automated loop where we actually just combine ChatGPT with iVerilog and have it automatically try and build things. Uh, and it's only until it gets stuck that it actually starts, you know, requesting feedback from the human and going, I don't know what the problem is here, right? Uh, and eventually we, we can hopefully get the design together. Um, and so these are, this is the benchmark that we did. This is our fully automated tests, right? So we came up with eight benchmarks here, or nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, eight benchmarks here, uh, where we got it to build these designs, but not only build them, it needed to test them, and not only test them, it needed to pass it itself. And this was fully automatic, right? So where it says TF, that means tool feedback, and it was able to fully complete that design on its own. However, and this is a big addendum, Sometimes it would finish, but actually the test bench it had produced, so we see here, right, it needs to build its own test bench, um, is not compliant with the actual specification. And so you end up with this, this scenario where it's built a design that doesn't actually work. It just doesn't realize it doesn't work. Um, so really, I think one of the, the thoughts that we have is that perhaps we need to combine with our specifications some kind of real test bench. And an additional challenge, I'll just mention this just to wrap up the discussion, an additional challenge, of course, is that functionality isn't your only concern when working with real designs, especially with things like processes or SOCs or intellectual, you know, third party IP blocks is that, of course, when you produce hardware, they may contain uh, weaknesses, right? Weaknesses from the point of view of security. If you have weaknesses in your hardware, that means that they might become vulnerable to, you know, various properties. Uh, you know, we, we hear, I don't know, every few months from Intel or AMD, some problem that has come out, whether it's Spectre or Meltdown or something like that, where they've made a mistake in their hardware specification. And it's not that it's non-functional, it's just that the way that their implementation works is exploitable. And so this is a, a concern that we need to think about if we start relying on these tools more and more, because right now the tooling for detecting that hardware CWEs exist in our designs is actually very, very rudimentary. Uh, so this is something that is, you know, we think really, really worth looking into. So to evaluate this, uh, we set up this basic security evaluation framework where we used GitHub Copilot. This wasn't using ChatGPT. This was using GitHub Copilot to try and evaluate whether or not Copilot would put uh, vulnerabilities into our designs. Here's an example, by the way. So this is CWE1234, which deals with debugging signals. And the problem here is that, okay, the top suggestion is actually good, but if you keep asking it for suggestions, so, you know, if you if, if you're unlucky, perhaps um, you actually find that sometimes it'll make mistakes. And if we synthesize this design, um, you'll see we have this is the good design. This is the happy path where it has suggested a design which is actually secure. And we've got our nice locking register up here, which properly deals with the debugging signals. Uh, but if we use, you know, if we're unlucky and we get the unhappy pathway, um, the synthesis tool actually detects that the, the debugging signal is not actually used and the lock signal is all irrelevant because of this particular else case that it's actually added in here. Um, and so, you know, that's a problem that we need to reflect on as well is that sometimes we need to make sure that our test features aren't just testing functionality, but we're also checking other properties of our code too, including the hardware security. Um, so we ended up doing 18 scenarios with GitHub Copilot. Of those, uh, seven had vulnerable top scoring options. And we actually, for those 18 scenarios, generated 198 designs um, with 56 of them being vulnerable. Well, those numbers are quite small because we had to do human analysis. And so we can't generate thousands and thousands of programs. We have to actually do manual review. 
Um, and so this kind of stems from both the training data and also the model limitations, right? So these models don't know anything. They do a very good imitation of knowing things, but they are at the end of the day, just statistical distributions of tokens over text. And so that means that they, uh, you know, they don't have fundamental rules encoded within them. They are actually just producing new text based on probabilities. Uh, and, and security doesn't really fit with that paradigm. Um, especially when you consider the fact that the open source data that they're being trained over probably also includes security vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and of course, the other problem is, is that you put out a design and everyone thinks it's secure and everyone thinks it's best practice for maybe years until someone actually realizes that there was a problem with that code. And now suddenly, you know, humans might know, oh, we can't base stuff on that design anymore, but your language model has no way of comprehending this additional context. So to reflect on everything, uh, you know, ASICs are expensive to manufacture, right? This is why we want to um, do this. Uh, designs have got to be correct. Uh, test benches and verification code we've discovered is challenging for large language models. It's not impossible. They're definitely on the way there, but they still have some functional and security challenges to deal with. So how can we adopt large language models safely? Well, I would argue that the question is actually exactly the same as the one that we ask when we say, how do we adopt our junior interns correctly, right? Because our junior interns are going to make the same kinds of mistakes that our language models make. So if you've got a company where you're bringing in brand new undergraduates who are, you know, who are working on your designs, how do you make sure that their code is good? You know, you probably already have a pipeline to do it. That pipeline is called checking what they produce. So as long as we are actually checking the code that are coming out of these language models and we're checking the code that comes out of things like ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot with our various suites of static analysis checks and functional verification and test benches and so on and so forth, hopefully we will find ourselves in a place where the code is working really, really well. Um, Large language models are going to be adopted. They're transforming software development as we speak. They're gonna transform hardware development as well, right? We're seeing study after study show that the productivity of people who are using these models are going up. Um, and already, uh, this is the post that GitHub Copilot just put out, right? They've got over a million people using it um, that, are, that are coding 55% faster and using to produce 46% of their code. Over 5,000 businesses now using GitHub Copilot, right? This is a big tool um, that's seeing lots and lots of adoption. Um, and so, you know, I would not be surprised to see maybe even only a few years from now, whether or not there are commercial tools in the EDA space also with numbers like this as well. Um, so, you know, I want to just now say, try it yourself, right? We're all here on this webinar because we're interested in using AI for hardware. The second AI-generated open source silicon design challenge is now open. Um, I think this is one of the most fun exercises that you can do with these language models right now because it's not just producing software, it's actually producing hardware. So um, I'm happy to take some questions, although I see that there is some uh, poll suggestion from Andrea. Um, if you're interested, quickly take a screen capture of the slide. This is all of our pieces of work that we have um, done recently, and they're all on archive as well as their actual academic links. So feel free to look that up. Um, and um, I'm quite happy to answer any questions. Um, but yeah, uh, poll and organizers, Great. how do you want me to do this? Yeah, so hi, thank you very much, uh, Hammond. And uh, let's start actually by the first, there are three questions in the Q&A session, in the Q&A. You click on hey, hey, Muhammad, I just I just launched the poll. So okay, you so you wanna, us, you... yeah, one minute, please. Okay, so first we'll do the poll for one minute, and then I'm going to jump into some questions and answers. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, we are almost there. I tried to vote in the poll, and then it told me I wasn't allowed. So I'm a bit yeah. sad. So I hope everyone is, I, I'll live vicariously through everyone else voting in the poll. Uh, go ahead and ask the question, um, uh, go through the questions, uh, Dr. Hammond, and I will end the poll as soon as the last um, 15 people have answered. Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, Andrea. Okay, so we've got some questions now. So. Um, so, Vipul, you've asked, can large language models produce efficient SPICE net lists for analog circuits? That is a great question. And actually, I've had that question from analog ASIC 
designers already. Um, my answer is we haven't looked into that. So I'm not an analog specialist and I'm not super qualified at um, knowing whether or not a given um, analog circuit is good or not. Um, but I can tell you that there are people looking into this, right? So, um, you know, we're definitely looking at the, the digital side of things. I'm very fascinated around the digital side of things. And in particular, I've brought up the security aspects here um, because that's the field that is, is the most interest to me. And if you have a look through this list of slides here, you'll see here that pretty, uh, the majority of them deal with security in some form or another, whether that's bug repair, bug finding, bug assertions, and, that's, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, so to answer your analog circuits, um, I'm not the best person to answer that question. Maybe even the eFabless folks that are on the call yeah, are so if I, than me. If I may, just, uh, this is Mohammed Qasim. So uh, the, the, uh, the expression efficiency here or efficient is a little bit uh, maybe uh, uh, not necessarily relevant for the analog design, but if you actually try it and you request a, like a low offset comparator in Sky 130, Literally, I would ask for that. It will generate a spice netlist for for you. And then, if you request the test benches, we're going to give you a, a pulse, you know, based test small test bench, uh, and you can have a conversation there. So it's it's going to take a little bit of a prompt engineering to be able to to get there. Uh, the but it will generate it, and it will you know uh, will be simulatable. Uh, I haven't tried beyond that, um, but it's it's I think it's going to get there. Yeah, so thanks very much, Mohammed. So hopefully that answered your question, um, people. Um, so the next question was from Hong Chol, uh, who asked, Rapid Silicon has recently re released Rapid GPT as an LLM for HDL, and yes, they have. We saw it came out like two or three days ago, I think. Um, we have been playing around with it. Of course, we haven't had enough time to do a full in-depth study. Um, I, my understanding is they've been a little bit uh, keeping close to their chest as how their model actually works, whether or not it's a fully custom trained model or whether it's just extensions or fine tuning to an existing model. Because of course, if we knew the answer to that, we'd know the best way to approach investigating it. Um, but certainly it is a chat based model. It integrates with Visual Studio Code. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested to play more with it, but um, yeah, we, we've only very briefly touched it already because it's only been three days and we haven't had enough time to fully investigate it. Uh, and then your second question here is Copilot works also well and I wonder if that can be used to generate test benches and, and, and HDL. Yes, of course. Um, in terms of the eFabless competition, they'll have more thoughts on this because of course it's an autocomplete model. It's not quite the same way as using something like ChatGPT where you kind of get it to do everything. With, with models like Copilot, right, you know, it's only maybe going to suggest one or two lines at a time, and it kind of assumes that you'll produce some of the code as well, right? It, it's really meant to, to, to just help you think a little faster, um, as opposed to doing the whole design for you. Uh, Suprio has asked, have you compared if the entire design was human coded and whether it was done faster with better quality than through ChatGPT? Now, that's a very interesting question because, of course, what does better quality mean, right? Does it mean fewer bugs? Does it mean smaller design? Does it mean implemented quicker? Does it mean lower costs, right? So that we, we've got metrics, right? Um, in terms of direct to human comparison, I think if you had a human expert right now, it would outperform ChatGPT. Uh, that's anecdotal, we haven't done that study. But I want to say that, uh, and if you have a look through our uh, uh, preprint that we posted, um, which is this one here, this conversational large language models for hardware design. Um, this uh, is our, our thought in the paper is that it only took us, in theory, just over two hours to design this whole process of using ChatGPT. Now, it did take a little bit longer because we had to have rate limits. Um, and there was this artificial, because we were doing this very early in the days of GPT-4 when we could only do a couple of messages every hour. Um, but if you actually stack it up with the time it took to generate and the time it took us to type it and run it, it only actually took two hours. So whether or not could you build a processor that runs an eight bit, you know, with that data path that I showed in two hours, maybe you can if you're like a wizard. Um, for me, I think I would take a little bit longer than that. So um, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And I think these kinds of comparisons are really important and we'll, we'll definitely be seeing them in the literature sooner rather than later. Um, Matt Genovese has asked, 
did you run into problems with the large language model remembering what it is previously generated? This will be a challenge for non-trivial designs. Matt, you have hit the nail on the head, and this is exactly why in our slides we had to have all of these different conversations. There is no way we could have fit all of this information into a single token limit. So if you're not fully aware about large language models, and I didn't mention this, so this is a good point, actually. Large language models have a finite amount of space, a finite amount, number of tokens that they can work over. Um, and this number is getting bigger. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, GPT 3.5, I think it is a 16,000 token, 16, yeah, 16,000 token version now, but I think the default one is still only 4,000 or 8,000 tokens. 8,000 tokens, of course, isn't that much, right? If that's four characters, that's only about 24,000 tokens worth, uh, sorry, 24,000 characters of Verilog, which is not very much, uh, especially when you're trying to combine it with all of this other information. And so what we did, Matt, was we observed pretty quickly that this was going to be a problem. And so we created multiple chat instances so that we could fit uh, the, the different uh, context windows to a specific task. Uh, and then what we would do at the beginning of each conversation, I, as, a, as the operator, would only copy in the pertinent information to then begin that next task. And that was how we tried to keep, so you'll see here the characters, we were trying to keep these characters under that crucial um, about 24,000 characters to, to try and fit it into the token limit. Now, the specification here went way over, so it was probably doing some kind of uh, trimming in the back end to try and fit it in the context window. But that's actually the reason why we broke this up into multiple conversations. So thank you for that question, Matt. That was a good one. Um, I'm getting questions in two different windows. So I'm going to finish the ones in the Q&A, and then I'll have a look at the ones in the chat window. Um, what's the criteria of a good query for GPT-4? Very good question. I think that is the answer. Uh, no one really knows what makes a good query for chat GPT-4. Certainly. The, the the most information you can provide it in the minimum number of amount of text. So as much information as concisely as you can is how we have observed that GPT-4 gives the best query. But this is a this is more of an art than a science, right? They, they call it prompt engineering, but there's really not very much engineering going on within it. Um, hey, uh, you've asked, can this ASIC design be used for neuromorphic computing and hardware? Great question. Give it a go. Let me know. Um, if you've got a specification, put it in and, and see if it can produce it. Anonymous attendee has asked, do you think generative AI could replace RTL engineers in the near future? Currently, I don't think there's much risk of that happening. What I think will happen is engineers using generative AI will maybe replace engineers who are not using generative AI because they'll be able to outperform them. They'll be able to work faster. Um, you know, that's just a, a, my own feeling. This is definitely not like a a, a, a statement of fact. It's, it's purely opinion based of my own opinion. And I do think that these tools are going to be force multipliers for engineers, right? Like they're going to help you write code faster and maybe even better than your peers who aren't using them. Uh, Tom has asked, how do you think of the scalability of large language models for verification? Because verification takes the longest time. That is true. And that's actually, you know, again, one of the key challenges. A lot of what we did here was just functionality. And one of the results, we sh you know, one of the points that we made here is that we don't think they're very good at verification yet, right? Test features and verification code continues to be challenging for large language models. Um, I think this is an open problem. This is something that we're continuing to investigate in our research group at the University of New South Wales and with my colleagues in collaboration at New York University. So we're really interested in knowing how we can make large language models better at verification so that we can rely on them. All right, so we've got some questions in the chat window now, so I'm going to quickly dive through those. And, and remember, uh, Andrea or Mohammed, you can just cut me off. I don't know what the time limits are. Um, uh, so question starting from the bottom, why would any company use ChatGPT to design hardware when the conversations will become part of the knowledge base of the large language model? Great question. If you've got sensitive intellectual property, you're going to have another challenge, right? Either you need a large language model that's got a service level agreement that says they're not going to copy your IP and then you have to trust it, or you need to have an in-house large language model. In-house large language models are doable. There are open source models. You can use StarCoder or StarChat, especially if you're doing software. Hardware-wise, tricky, right? So we've actually trained some open source language models. You're more than happy, uh, you know, I'll, I'll plug myself here. 
Um, we've got this model, this link here, training and evaluating Verilog large language models, which was published at date earlier this year. Have a look at this one. We have linked to an open source set of code gen models that we trained to write Verilog code for you in an autocomplete way. So they, they act like Copilot. Um, because they're running open source, okay, you know, you have to still consider the implications of open source training and languages and licenses and that kind of stuff that the courts haven't dealt with yet. Um, but at least your intellectual property is safe. Um, what is the criteria? Okay, someone's asked that. We already did that one. Uh, I think this might be all of the questions. So thanks, everyone. I really enjoyed that. Um, Oh, and we'll have one last question from Nyla. Uh, challenges or limitations you've faced when integrating generative AI into ASIC design workflows? Well, actually, that is the title of our paper. If I click this to plug it now, it says challenges and opportunities in conversational hardware design. So to answer that one, I would like to steer you towards our paper, which really does step through what I've talked about today in this presentation and the various um, challenges that we found, um, in particular, the limitations of the section. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I, I enjoyed all of the questions and, and speaking today. And thank you very much, Ethan, for having me on. Thank you very much, uh, Hammond. And thanks to everyone that uh, uh, joined us here today, as well as the, uh, the number of questions on the different on different topics. Uh, feel free to uh, to join to join the channel um, uh, Slack channel for the generative AI on the open source uh, silicon uh, design community. As well as uh, just I wanted to remind you that uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, August 18, 9 a.m. Pacific time, there is an, another session of webinar to go over the Caravel um, uh, uh, chip design uh, or SOC that is used as the, the carrier chip for the designs coming into the competition. Uh, please, if you are joining the competition, uh, go ahead and start your project on the website so that you can have some sort of an iterative uh, approach to the to the submission rather than uh, waiting for the last minute. Uh, just as a reminder here, this is uh, the, the the quality of the submission depends on the uh, not just the design and the design complexity and design, also depending on the documentation and how usable the work that you presented uh, that you are submitting. And as uh, Dr. Pierce here mentioned earlier, if you, you look at his example um, and also the examples from the, um, uh, the second and the third uh, winners of the previous competition, um, you will see that there is a um, the, the conversation is there and enabling other people to use it and reproduce uh, the, uh, the, the similar results. So please make sure that um, you think of others that are using your work and and um, and uh, we look forward to your uh, design. And very quickly, we've got somebody pointing out that that uh, Slack channel link might be wrong in the background, uh, Andrea. Uh, so if either you or Mohammed could post a, an updated one, that would be helpful. I am doing it right now. Okay, and um, while they're posting, um, I'll I'll plug myself again. Um, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Uh, I just put my email in the Zoom chat, so if you have further questions for me, please uh, feel free to reach out. Okay, so I wrote it and I just wrote it wrong, so it... thank you. Thank you very much, Hammond. Yeah, that was excellent, Hammond. I think we got pretty fantastic feedback from the community. The questions are really, really on point as well. People are obviously uh, really, uh, there's a lot of people who are trying to understand what's going on. And, uh, and figure out what the bounds and limitations are. Many of us were aware of the rapid GPT release. <laughs> uh, haven't yep. had a chance to try it yet, but very interested also. Uh, some of you may know that we are, uh, we're directly connected with, uh, with those guys also uh, very actively. And Narveen was actually uh, one of the judges on the uh, last challenge and is one of the judges on this round of the challenge. So uh, uh, there's a very direct connection between us and rapid silicon also. And we, had a, we have a competition entry uh, I believe last time and this time also from Rapid Silicon as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate your uh, joining the webinar and looking forward to more. There will be another one uh, next week for Q&A around as you get closer to the submission. 
any obstacles. It could it will be more like a, an availability as call it office hours for anything that is needed uh, that uh, that could be in a way of uh, getting your submission in, whether it's on the generative AI side or the the back end and the submission uh, of your design to the competition. Thank you.